Hello and welcome to Science Fiction, Race, and Racism. This is a video blog and channel about the most famous and influential works in science fiction and how they deal, deal with issues of race, ethnicity, racism, prejudice, and intolerance. Both the best and the worst, the most groundbreaking and insightful, and the most callous and clueless. Science fiction has a long history of both being opposed to racism, prejudice, and intolerance, but also of conscious or unconscious racism. Sci-fi fans, authors, and works are often said to be above, beyond, incapable of, and far past any prejudice. That is often the appeal of sci-fi, especially the most utopian works. Sometimes a sci-fi setting, story, or theme can be another way to comment upon, critique, or tear apart prejudice and hatred. For others, sci-fi is pure escapism, a way to get away from such issues. Sometimes this backfires. The most escapist sci-fi work is often the most racist. Sometimes the same three approaches or beliefs coexist within a work of sci-fi, within an author or a sci-fi fan. My name is Al Carroll. I'm Associate Professor of History at Northern Virginia Community College. I teach American, American Indian, and Latin American history. I've written mostly about wars, veterans, human rights, and genocide. I've also written some science fiction, mostly alternate history, including a sci-fi alternate history book, The Man in Black, the first of a series. The Planet of the Apes was originally based on Pierre Bouillet's 1963 novel. Bouillet was previously best known for Bridge Over the River Kwai. In over 50 years, it has been nine films, two TV series, comic books, video games, and was the first sci-fi series to widely use toys and merchandising. Bouillet's book was mostly arguing man's intelligence and civilization were not fixed, that they could regress and disappear at any time. Once it was made into a film, it became primarily about race and racism in America, as well as the Cold War and nuclear war, thanks to writer Rod Serling, best known for The Twilight Zone. Though other writers worked on it, Serling gets most of the credit, including its famous shock ending. Coming out during the Civil Rights Movement and its original sequels during the rise of black power, it's almost inevitable the films would be seen as, and are, a commentary on race. Ape and monkey have long been common epithets used by racists in America for black or African. Entertainer Sammy Davis personally complimented Rod Serling for writing the best film he'd ever seen about racism. Black audiences saw the films as being mostly about white fears about them. There is a racial hierarchy among the apes in the series. Darker apes are seen as stronger, aggressive, and less intelligent. Lighter apes are seen as better, civilized, advanced. Gorillas are the soldiers and police, and menial laborers. Chimpanzees with brown hair and light brown faces are in intermediate positions. They are often scientists and intellectuals, but except for later during the uprising, they are not in power. Some of those suggested that chimpanzees are stand-ins for Jews and other minorities who are highly ed educated achievers, but still live in fear of discrimination. At the top are the white apes blonde or red-headed orangutans. They are always the leaders, scientists, even though they may not be the best at it, as they are fearful, dictatorial, and use persecution and censorship. This was Sterling's criticism of white supremacy. The ape lawgiver, their Christ figure and founder, is orangutan, an implicit attack on the notion of Jesus as white. Charlton Heston, played by the astronaut Taylor, playing the astronaut Taylor, is a symbol of white and Western civilization. Heston played in his career Moses, Ben-Hur, Andrew Jackson, Thomas Jefferson, El Cid, and Michelangelo, many of the figures central to white identity, the big ex exception being Christ. Over the course of the film, Heston has every aspect of Western civilization taken from him, technology, clothing, and then speech by an injury. When he tries to assert his equality and later his superiority to apes, he is put on trial, convicted in a manner similar to Galileo. The film Trial also has an explicit comparison to Dostoevsky's The Grand Inquisitor. In the second film, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, the apes are preparing to make war on humans in the Forbidden Zone. The ape general rallies his troops in the public with the cry, The only good human is a dead human. This was a deliberate play on several of the most notorious racist quotes. American General Phil Sheridan famously said to Comanche Chief Turtledove, 
the only good Indian is a dead Indian, or the only good Indians I ever saw were dead. Later, Teddy Roosevelt was widely quoted saying, I don't go so far as to think the only good Indians are dead Indians, but I believe nine out of 10 are, and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the 10th. There is also an implicit criticism of humans on the planet of the apes. The primitive humans are all white, European ancestry, no Africans, Asians, or others. This implies at some point the ancestors of, primi of primitive whites exterminated or drove away anyone not white. Where do they go? The advanced mutant survivors under New York City are a mix of different races and include mixed race people. They are also integrated with blacks among the leadership. The next film had three surviving apes from nuclear war going back in time. The fourth film, Battle for the Planet of the Apes, imagined apes made into forced labor, slaves. The apes as stand-ins for blacks could not have been more explicit. The Apes Revolt. The filmmakers deliberately made the street battle scenes similar to the Watts riots in Los Angeles. In theaters with mostly black audiences, it was widely reported they cheered for the revolting apes. But many white audiences often found the uprising depicted as scary to them, a disturbing possible future. The ending was deliberately softened. It originally ended with an angry call for continuing revolt. One of the main human characters, a black government leader named McDonald, makes an appeal at the end, speaking as, quote, the descendant of slaves. After these previews, filmmakers added the ape leader Caesar giving a quick voice voiceover, and very out of character, he calls for humane treatment of humans. It's hard not to see that as a call for blacks to not be as cruel to whites as whites were to blacks. The final film in the original series, Battle for the Planet of the Apes continued these same themes. A new black advisor to Caesar continued to be his advisor and conscience. The film ended with humans no longer as servants to apes. The lawgiver for the apes gives a final speech to humans and apes side by side, children both black and white, and all types of apes learning together. Caesar's statue cries, imply, implying he worries such coexistence will not last. There was a brief TV series with 13 episodes and a children's animation series for half a season, both only occasionally touching on the series themes. As the U.S. became more conservative, it elected an at times open racist in Ronald Reagan in 1980, and the series name became used in another context. White racist used Planet of the Apes as an epithet for a black controlled society nation or neighborhood. In Spike Lee's famous Do the Right Thing, the character Pino constantly attacks blacks as apes, even calling the black Brooklyn neighborhood as, quote, it's like Planet of the Apes around here. The epithet was also widely used by white supremacists to refer to Barack Obama, his administration, even supposed impending white genocide. The best known example was Roseanne Barr's notorious racist tweet that led to the canceling of her show. She proudly endorsed the most racist U.S. president in 150 years, Donald Trump, and she referred to a former advisor of Obama as, quote, a child of the planet of the apes. A terrible Tim Burton remake didn't touch upon any of the series' themes. Of the three remakes in the newer series, only War for the Planet of the Apes makes explicit arguments with some obvious parallels. The apes are imprisoned in a literal concentration camp. Its commander has a shaved head, deliberately invoking neo-Nazis. At one point he uses the long-standing racialized argument of the last stand, that whites in Western civilization are under siege by non-white savages. The Times of Israel compared the ape leader Caesar to Moses and his apes to Zionists because there are very obvious Holocaust parallels being made. The apes are also brutalized very similar to enslaved Africans. In the course of the film, the, the colonel will even invoke building a wall and making the apes pay for it, a direct critique of Trump's racist fear-mongering. The Planet of the Apes series continues to strike a chord with viewers for over half a century. A French writer's novel intended to argue human intelligence and civilization could fall away easily, instead has become a vehicle 
on how and why on how and why white America fears blacks. This is the end of the sixth video. I look forward to your comments and questions. Please repost freely, like, share, and comment. Next video, we will discuss Star Wars, race, and ethnicity. This has been Science Fiction, Race, and Racism, video blog and channel.